Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of CNF Talks, where we interview speakers at some of our forthcoming events. Uh, today, we're talking to Zygmunt Lezinski, who's the global lead of Quantum Safe Networks at IBM. And Zygmunt is speaking at the Security, the Cybersecurity and Financial Services Summit 2024, which is being held on the 11th of June uh, in London. Uh, Zygmunt, welcome. Thank you. Uh, let's turn to our first question. Uh, AI and machine learning are increasingly being used by cyber criminals to perpetrate cyber attacks, uh, particularly in relation to phishing. Uh, what new technological developments do you think pose the greatest risk to companies? Well, it, it's interesting you say that. If we actually look at the data, and so IBM runs an operation called X-Force, which is our proactive security operation where we actually monitor what's happening on the internet in our clients' networks. Um, if we actually measure what's going on, um, we would observe that actually most of the attacks we're seeing at the moment, the, the biggest increase was in identity theft and in information stealing. And we haven't yet seen generative AI used as an attack vector at scale. Now, part of the reason for that is cybercrime is a business like any others. And while people are experimenting with the use of Gen AI, they haven't yet deployed it at scale. Mm. And our thinking is that once you get, once that happens, obviously there are clearly a whole set of things that, that can be done, but enterprises should be monitoring for that to happen. So they should be proactively looking to understand what the uh, threat actors are doing and we publish a report every year as do several of the other um, cyber companies that, that you can make use of. But if you then step back and say, okay, when people start to use uh, generative AI, what threats might you see? And, and we can use as examples things that have already been done. Um, uh, there's one example from Hong Kong where uh, somebody used a set of uh, deep fakes for a video conference to convince an employee of a financial institution uh, to transfer you know, 200 million Hong Kong dollars to a wicked person. So, yeah. but that obviously takes a lot of effort. And, and so one of the things that we did do when we analyzed this is we looked at how much effort is it going to be for a, a cyber threat actor to actually exploit AI? And what are the benefits to them? And we think that it will help Redu Once they have mastered the the technology, it will give them the ability to generate, for example, phishing attacks much more economically than they can do now. So down from maybe 16 hours to craft an attack to perhaps a few minutes. Obviously, that increases the um, threat to everybody. Again, I come back to the point, start monitoring what's going on, understand the risk landscape, and perhaps ensure that you're monitoring your, your own networks and systems looking for these sorts of attacks. Mm. So, so those, those are the key things for, for companies now to, to start thinking about the potential of what's going to happen in the future from generative AI attacks, and, and thereby hopefully uh, preempting uh, the, those attacks. Uh, have you seen, what, what's the sort of best practice you've seen in companies? Are there, are there any examples of companies which have gone a long way down this path, preparing for the future types of attacks that you've just described, and particularly well, in financial services? What you're actually seeing happen is that the companies that provide cybersecurity platforms, the company that provides cybersecurity services, are all taking this on board as, as part of their responsibility to um, you know, build that capability. So, for example, what's the date? Monday this week, Amazon and IBM published a, a paper to help firms understand the security issues around generative AI. That's available. You can download it and get an idea of that. But what you will actually see happen is that AI technology will be embedded in security products. So if you think about um, incident monitoring, if you think about 
user behavior monitoring. Those are the places where you can apply machine learning. Event monitoring, you get hundreds of thousands, millions of events a day. You want to classify them into completely uninteresting or anomalous. Potentially, that's an area where we are already deploying AI technology to help us do that classification. In the same way, user behavior monitoring. You or I, I mean, you're logged in from home today. Perhaps later this week, you'll log in from the office. You might log in from a hotel in, let's say, Manhattan. It's going to be really strange if you log in from, ooh, I don't know, Madagascar or Baghdad or from a, a VPN coming from a, a Tor browser. So that sort of user anomaly detection, we can go, hmm, somebody's using their privileges, but is that actually the person who has that authority or is it somebody who's stolen their credentials and is disguising their access? So those are the sorts of places we deploy artificial intelligence. And, and you yeah. then embed those in the solutions that are used to secure operational technology, to secure customer handling agents. I mean, financial services, we need people to talk to customers. We need to secure those. Uh, anything to do with personal information, we need to secure that. And as we increasingly use um, chatbots, clearly yeah. that's a place where we're going to need to look at the security of the development of those chatbots and to make sure that they are not themselves exploited. So there's a set of things we can do, and we can already see early examples of those. And again, good, boring practice, understand the best practice, make sure that you're deploying it, make sure that your systems are up to date and yeah. that you don't have your know, CVEs exposed on your systems. You know, that's that's kind of bad. OK, very interesting. I'm turning on to your, your specialism mm. uh, in quantum networks. I, I read somewhere about how when quantum computing is deployed more widely, that current cryptography is not going to be particularly useful, uh, yes. thereby, I, if that is true, thereby opening up a huge new area uh, for potential vulnerability. Uh, could you explain how, how quantum uh, networks uh, can help uh, sure. in terms of reducing cyber threats and how widely it's been adopted? Yes, of course. So we rely on cryptography. It, cryptography is not just about Letchley Park, although that's mm. really, really cool. Go visit. Um, yeah, yeah, I that's agree. Just that's just one example that gives us message confidentiality that your WhatsApp message will get to somebody and won't be intercepted. But we also rely on cryptography to secure our identity management when you log on to a system. We rely on cryptography to secure um, private data, personally identifiable information, so it can't be uh, copied and exposed. And we rely on encryption to secure software so that when we upload new software into a machine, we know that it's been digitally signed and can't be hacked. Now, if I have a cryptographically, if I have a big enough quantum computer, the risk is that I can defeat the encryption that we use for many of those tasks. We use public key encryption, and it's based on a problem that a quantum computer can break really easily. OK, so we understood that about 20 years ago. Over the last decade, there's been a global program led by the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US to develop new encryption algorithms that are secure against classical computers and against quantum computers and that run on your smart card, on your phone, on your server. So over the coming decade, we have the job of updating the cryptography that we use in our core banking systems, in our payment terminals, in the way we log on to systems in our websites in order to be quantum safe. And that process has started. I mean, the federal government in the US has published a timeline that says by 2033, all national security systems must be transferred by 2035 all federal systems must be secure and in banking we're now seeing for example the bank of international settlements did a pilot last year interconnecting the deutsche bank and the french central bank to secure interbank payments because of course you know the credit limit on one of those is 
$10 billion minus a cent. So it's a lot of money. Um, those things are, are people are starting to secure them. We saw UK Finance publish a paper last year looking at this area. We saw the Financial Conduct Authority publish a guidance on the regulation in this area at Davos. In telecoms where I work, we've built um, a, a task force to study the transition to quantum safe in our industry. We published recommendations um, and detailed use cases to help guide all of the clients. And we've just seen the first of those happening in, in financial services. So uh, two weeks ago, in the Emerging Payments Association created a task force also to look at how do we secure payments in future. Um, Monetary Authority of Singapore has asked all of the CEOs there that this is now planning for update your cryptography is now a um, to now a regulatory requirement for all FIs on the island. So what we're seeing happen is people are starting to understand there's a risk here. Yeah. This now needs to be something you plan for. Don't panic. Start planning. Build capability and you know, talk to your vendors about how their ecosystems are being secured and how you can basically take advantage of that as you update your systems over the next few years. Do, do you think, though, just a supplementary question, if I may, <laughs> do, do you think that the expectation as to when quantum computing is going to be readily available uh, to bad actors amongst good actors and so on, do, do you think that the timetables that these various initiatives are working to are sufficient? Or do you think quantum computing is going to be uh, upon us much sooner? Well, we're reasonably confident that, I mean, there is a IBM and various other firms have published roadmaps for likely quantum computers out to 2033. There are already 20 of them on the cloud if you want to make yeah. use of one. Um, but at the moment, they are not at a scale that threatens the cryptography that we use. And yeah. we recently did some research along with NIST from the United States, um, Microsoft, uh, Waterloo University in, in the, to, to say, well, do we put what to actually ex answer exactly the question you asked? Do we believe that we will see a risk from quantum computers before they're widely deployed? And, and our conclusion was actually, we think you're going to see useful quantum computing for areas like uh, the chemistry of electric vehicles, corrosion in advanced materials. Those applications will be at scale on quantum computers before we get crypto cryptographically relevant quantum computers. So from that perspective, it's it's slightly delayed. The, you know, the use of this stuff by bad actors is slightly delayed over some of the good applications. And I think if we follow that timeline, you know, the US government one's not a bad one. If we plan to replace our systems within the next decade, we should be okay. On the other hand, if you take no action, think about how long it takes to update every system in a large enterprise. You've got infrastructure, network, storage, servers, you've got hypervisors, you've got your home built applications, your vendor applications, your devices, your databases. By the time you put all that together and think about it, if you don't start now, then you may well run the risk that and people can come along and, and do bad things in the future. So again, start planning, but don't panic, but you've got a multi-year task ahead of you. Very interesting. Uh, clearly a, a problem of huge scale, and let's hope all the expectations about timing uh, are right. Uh, for our viewers, we very much hope that you'll be able to join us in person oh, at, I... the cyber, at the Cybersecurity Financial Services Summit on the 11th of June. And, and Zygmunt, I'd just like to say thank you very much for sharing that. that some very interesting observations and insights there. Thank you very much for the invitation. I will see you on the 11th. Look forward to it. Thank you.